The second point is how do we tackle failure? And this is arguably the biggest difference in how we might train um, di different dogs of ours, right? And, and for sure, some of the dogs that we work with have a predisposition to cope with failure better than others. So I would definitely say that my Cocker Spaniels would deal with failure way better than she would right from day one. Mm -hmm. So right from, from, their, from their predisposition. But how we tackle it may be a different thing. Because I can tell you now, she will fail again and again and again and again if she needs to. Yeah, but what I don't don't do is set her up to do that um, and I don't I, I don't she, she, she she's had to be trained in a very different way and yet she will if we go into competition or to any type of training she's quite a robust little dog now uh, but that's been framed and um, trained it, it correctly so we've set her up right from the beginning knowing that failure was tough right away from her for, yeah, for her absolutely and if you don't get oh it oh did this my to me word. a lot yesterday it's really naughty oh my word I know it's a really naughty thing we need it's our own one I think there we go. And if you don't get this right, then what it leads to is frustration. And frustration can lead to loss of motivation and also loss of this thing called grit that we're going to be speaking more and more about. But what we really underestimate, and we see this a lot in the naughty but nice dogs that we work with, that they start out life as optimists. But so very quickly, they become pessimists because of how failure is tackled in day to day life and how failure is tackled in dog training. And when we say failure, what we mean is that, for example, you might be playing a game and your dog doesn't do what you want. What do you do? Or you might be training a, a behavior or a trick and they don't do what they want what, and they don't do what you want. Or it might just be day to day life and they do something wrong. What do we do about it? And we like to look at it a little bit like this, that the seeds here, this little seed, um, is failure in a, a training session. And what failure is actually is an ambiguous situation. The understanding wasn't there. Your dog didn't know what to do. And we have a choice. We could give them a negative outcome or we could teach them that it's not something to be worried about. But if we give them the negative outcome, if we don't tackle failure properly, this seed becomes pessimism in every aspect of life, not just your training sessions. Does that make sense? It's like the tiny building blocks of pessimism. So what we're taught, reward-based dog trainers, is that we reward what we do want and we ignore what we don't want. Who has heard this before? <laughs> Sounds really simple, doesn't it? <laughs> Oh, um, practically, <laughs> practically, this doesn't really work. Um, and practically, this can create a very naughty but nice dog. This can create a very pessimistic dog because what we're teaching them is there's a good outcome and a bad outcome. And when a dog's likely to make bad choices, when they're not sure what to do, when there's an ambiguous situation in front of them, when there's a new situation in front of them, they don't know the choice to make. And this way of training teaches them that, yeah, that's bad. So when they see that dog giving ambiguous signals or they see the man with the beard and the wizard's hat, the novel thing that we all you know, occasionally encounter, they see it as something bad because that's what we've taught them in the training sessions. That's what these puppies have learnt when they're being taught the sit in puppy training class. That makes sense. Is it a bit of a shock to some of you that that could do that? Oh, I love this. Um, so, um, makes sense. This is how we want you to start thinking about things. And this is an example of how we might work with three very different types of dog, okay? So the green bar is when they get it right, when they make the right choice. And what we'll do is we'll use the example of us ask. And you can parents. take pictures of all sides, guys, that you would like to, we're fine with that. Um, the, we're gonna use an example of us asking for a, a down on a walk, okay? A down behavior. and. Dog number one, dog number one is a very optimistic, very resilient, very gritty dog, because this is all down to this concept of grit. And they're very gritty, they're very resilient, they're very optimistic, and therefore it's quite okay with that dog to use the um, situation that um, we saw on the original slide, the thing that you'll read in all the books. Um, and that is that if they get it right, they do the D-O-W-N, then they get the food, if they get it wrong, they're going to get zero. They're going to get nothing. Now, a lot of, for a lot of dogs, the easily frustrated types, the pessimistic types, that would result in a spiraling, barking, screaming mess if you went cold turkey, right? So 
then if we think about those types of dog, then actually what we need to do is introduce you to something called the consolation prize, where it's like, you didn't get it right, but you know what? I don't want you to get frustrated. I don't want you to get pessimistic. I want this to be a, a, a progressive session and a session that's constantly getting better, better and better results. So I might say, good try and give you a pat on the side if that dog found that rewarding. But, but uh, what the, they the really thing want I want you this. to really know, though, guys, is know whether your dog does find any of those things rewarding, because I really believe that so many people are not aware of what their dogs actually find rewarding. We have it in our heads that a dog will like a pat on the side, but really watch your dog, because a lot of dogs don't actually like that. Um, really, really knowing that will make the, sometimes the biggest area of improvement is actually to look at the dog in front of you and understand exactly what is, and uh, one of your homework straight away should be to go home and just really think about all of the things your dogs find rewarding that are not food or toy based. Mm -hmm. So think of all the other things, the nodding is good. <laughs> so for example, the dog in the middle here would probably be Beth the Border Collie, because she actually would get very annoyed that she got it wrong and she'd probably get very frustrated. And if I didn't train the dog in front of me and I treated her how all the books tell you to treat a dog, then actually we'd only get one repetition. And the frustration is fast and it's huge. Like her frustration is quick. And I know that um, Fiji, six years ago, I built in frustration in my behaviours by doing exactly what the book tells us. Um, and I built in frustration really, it, and, and it's, it's big when they mm. get frustrated, yeah. right? And it's stressful. And it spills and it's, over into day-to-day -day life, which is the underestimated thing. Which for Fiji became barking. So barking became the thing. So the frustration for sure comes, it, there's a lot of barking. Whenever we're frustrated, barking. Bets would be, she does do like a Bets buff would be, movement. would be squeaking a lot. Yeah. If she, she would, if I built this in and I asked Bet for behaviours, then every behaviour would have a squeak or a bark or it's like she can't, almost can't control it. Her mouth opens and the sound comes out. So this is where training the dog in front of you is really important. Now, then we encounter, and it, this, these aren't common, okay? These types of dogs are not common, but we do see it where, and Illy was one of these actually, where I could train her and she, would get, she wouldn't get something right necessarily, or I wouldn't reward her quite quickly enough and she'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go lie in my bed for the rest of the day. And I would and definitely that would say it. she could be this dog, so yeah. for sure she's got that in her to be like that. Uh, and uh, Tiki, my Border Collie, um, she could definitely um, have that in her. So if, if they really didn't get anything right, um, I know that she failed a few times on something and she walked home. She just took herself home um, and home is at home. So it's not a big place she walked, but she went home and I looked around and I was like, she got it wrong and she'd just gone home. <laughs> and it is it's like the, the lack of any, like she, she's really, really um, very, very, very sensitive to, to any level of failure. Mm. Doesn't like to fail, doesn't like to get things wrong. But at the same time, um, the lack of reward is, is going to be a problem. Yeah. And those of you that are kind of like really into like the geeky dog training books, there'll be some... Um, author that has not touched a dog in a long time saying to you, well, you need to use errorless learning, right? Um, and that means that the dog never fails. These dogs are designed to identify, for example, when there is a lame sheep in a flock of a thousand, they can tell when they get it wrong, right? <laughs> they can tell when we're disappointed. They can tell when actually a, be a different outcome would have been better. So for those dogs, we can't use something like errorless learning. It doesn't really exist in dog training, in my opinion. Um, and we need to actually say, right, the right answer gets high value food. The, low, the, the wrong answer is gonna get a low value piece of food. So we're still, we're almost like, if you look at the difference between value on these columns, then some dogs, they're gonna need them to be almost matched. But the cool thing is, and what we're not taught enough in reward-based dog training is that behavior will travel towards the highest value column, right? So if you're always using the highest value thing for the right answer, the dog's gonna do the right answer more and, and more that and is, more. That is just your dog being efficient. Ruff! <laughs>